Welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you that are watching online, for those of you that are here, we're about uh, 15 minutes late, so we'll only go to about midnight. I was kidding. We're not going to go to midnight. <laughs> this is the first of three sermons or lessons on Moadi Yehovah HaSukot. Now you notice it says on the screen, Moed HaSukot. The word Moed explains or uh, is feast. Ha is of, Sukkot is booths or tabernacles. So it's a feast of tabernacles. I introduced it as Moadi Yehovah Ha Sukkot because in Leviticus 23, verse 2 and verse 4, it is clearly the Lord's feast. He says, These are my feast. This is Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The appointed seasons of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Now, for those of you who have not been watching or paying attention to previous lessons, these are the feasts of the Lord, and they are holy convocations. This appears in two verses apart. It appears in uh, Leviticus 23.2, and then it's repeated again in Leviticus 23.4. Uh, 20, these are Moedi Yehovah, Mikrae Ele, excuse me, Asher Elechem Moadi. So these are holy assemblies. The word Mekrae is an assembly or a, 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 a group of people. You have to remember in the wilderness when, when, uh, when, Moses was giving these instructions to the Israelites. There were about 4 million Israelis or Israelites. So we're talking about the entire congregation when the Lord says, tell the children of Israel, tell the congregation of Israel. Today, we have a much larger congregation because we read in, in Romans eleven seventeen that you, although of, of an not of an olive sheet, a, a, sh a olive shoot of a wild shoot, have been grafted into the olive tree, and therefore you are now part of the kingdom that God repre represents as His chosen people, the Israelites. Amen. Amen. So these are Moadi Yehovah. The Hebrew emphatically says, "Mekrei Kadosh Elechem Moadi." So it starts with Moadi and ends with Moadi. It says they're kadosh, they're holy. It says they're mekrai, these are assemblies. But another word, another definition for the word mekrai is a rehearsal. Okay, and then we see, and then we see the word ele and chem. Both of these words have the same definition. They both translate into the word these in English. What's interesting is that those that phrase only appears eight times, eight places in Scripture total. It appears once in the genealogy of, of uh, Ishmael. It appears once in the gene genealogy of uh, Saul. And all of the other times, the other six times, it appears to describe the importance of the genealogy of the Levitical order of the Levites. It's the only time it's ever used. It's a very, very unique phraseology. So there it is in the, in the transliterated he, he, uh, English. So these are holy assemblies with a spe they are, are special feasts, and they belong to the Lord. Now, let's look at what Jesus did concerning the appointed seasons. This is something we haven't covered uh, in as much detail as I am going to do today, but I want to show this to you that, that Scripture tells us that Yeshua, Jesus, did observe these feasts. Uh, for the purpose of the next several slides, and for this part of this, uh, this sermon, I'm going to be using the David Stern's Complete Jewish Bible as it clarifies the translation in the Gospel of John. When I first became a believer, I thought John was the most anti-Semitic 
gospel writer in existence until I realized that all the gospel writers were Jews. There's a question as to whether or not Luke is, uh, because he never states that he is. So he could be a Gentile. A lot of people think he's a Gentile. I believe he was Jewish also, just never stated it. See, when Yohanan, John's gospel, was translated into English, the term of the Jews referred to a location, Judea, and subsequently the residents or the citizens of Judea, in other words, the Judeans. Judea is the southern kingdom, the tribe of Judah. Primarily, it was the descendants of Judah. The, uh, it, uh, it was uh, the, some of the tribe of Benjamin was there, and of course, every tribe had Levites, because Levites did not have ownership of property. <laughs> also keep in mind that there was no J sound in the Hebrew or in Semitic languages. There's also no J sound in Greek. There's also no J sound in classic Latin. So Jesus was never the name until the J was put into the English language a mid uh, 16th century around 1540. Uh, the J and the U was actually added into the language. So, at any rate, John 2, 3, from the Complete Jewish Bible, David Stearns says, it was almost time for the festival of Pesach in Yehuda, and Yeshua went up to Yerushalayim, that's Jerusalem. In John 6, 4, and 5, in the Complete Jewish Bible, talks about the Passover. It says, now the Judean festival of Pesach was coming up. So when Yeshua looked up and saw, saw that there was a large crowd was approaching, he said to Philip, where will we be able to buy bread so that these people can eat? Now what's really interesting is the term bread is lechem. But with the Passover season, this was going to have to be matzah unleavened bread. Now, why the large crowd? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day after the, the Feast of Passover, is one of the three annual pilgrimages required in Scripture in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. I want to say hi to Rita. I want to say hi to uh, Pam. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm not going to wave at you because, uh, well, I'm talking to other people here, but thanks for coming on. John 7, verses 2 and 3, and then 10, talks about the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. It says in verse 2, it says, But the festival of Sukkot in Yehuda was near. In verse 3, So his brothers said to him, We used this the other day, and uh, Leave here and go into Yehuda, so that your Talmudim, that's your, tr your disciples, can see the miracles that you do. Now, you have to understand at this particular time it was not Yeshua, is not Jesus' time yet, and so he told them no, he wasn't going to go. But then we go all the way down to verse 10, John 7, 10, it says, But after his brothers had gone up to the festival, he went too, not publicly, but in secret. In John eleven fifty five, we're talking again about another Passover. You have to understand that the Gospel of John is chronologically said. It's the only one of the four Gospels that is chronological. I talked about this when I was talking, when I was teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. The Judean festival of Pesach, this is the second Passover now, was near and many people went up from the country to Yerushalayim, that's Jerusalem, to perform the purification ceremony prior to Pesach. Now we think of the purification ceremony as a baptism. But in ancient Israel, it was done to cleanse yourself, not only when you're converting, not only when you're coming back to, to uh, Judaism or to the Hebrew culture, Hebrew religion, but it was also done before each of the festivals. It was also done before uh, Aaron went into the Holy of Holies when we talked about Yom Kippur. So this was a cleansing cer ceremony. We read in John 12, verses 12 and 13, continuing, The next day the large crowd that had come from the festival heard that Yeshua was on his way into Yerushalayim. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Deliver us! 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai, of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, if you actually read this, you'll also notice that in Matthew 24, excuse me, Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, after Jesus' disciples asked him, when will we know? Uh, when will you be coming again? And essentially what he says is, not one stone will be left unturned. In other words, he's telling his disciples the, the <laughs> temple is going to be destroyed. And then he goes on and he says, you, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Actually, that came first. You who killed the prophets, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he and comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, what Yeshua, Jesus is saying is he's coming back to Jerusalem. He's not coming back to Minneapolis. He's not coming back to New York. He's not coming back to uh, Nairobi. He's not coming back to uh, Hong Kong. He's coming back to Jerusalem. And he's only going to come back when there are enough Jewish believers who are in Jerusalem to welcome him back. That's why Satan has constantly, over the last three millennia, have been killing off Jews or having the various adversaries kill Jews. The most recent one, of course, was the Nazi Holocaust. But if you take a look at what's going around the world today as far as anti-Semitism, it's as bad, if not worse, than it was in the 1930s and 40s. All right. So Paul, Saul Paul also observed the Feast of the Lord. We read in Acts, this is not the complete Jewish Bible, this is Acts 18. Uh, you read in uh, verses 20 and 21, when they asked him to stay a, a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. Now, what's interesting is the last time I was talking about the Feast of Yom Kippur, and I said that the King James Version, the New King James, the Modern King James, the NIV, and a number of other versions of the Bible don't actually tell you why, what, what, the, the, uh, what the sins of Azazel was and the purpose of the second goat taking away the sins of Azazel. What's interesting is in in uh, King James and the New King James Version, these are the only th those are the only two verses that actually tell you use the word feast in English. The other Bible versions don't. That's why I use multiple Bible versions, because otherwise you don't really get the true understanding. King James actually says he's going to observe the feast in Jerusalem. Now in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, this is the New King James. It says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover sacrifice, what our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. So he's telling all of his followers to keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, if Paul, Saul Paul, is telling us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 to keep it, then why don't we keep the feasts? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Because you're grafted into the olive tree. You are one of his chosen people. You are part of the apple of his eye, of God's eye. Those are terms that are used for the Israelites, for the Jews. Romans eleven seventeen. I mentioned it earlier. This is the ESV version. It says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, a Gentile, that's my emphasis, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. And then he goes on in Colossians 2, 17, as I've mentioned several times during this series. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in the Messiah in Christ. This is Paul's teaching. He's teaching about the feasts. He's telling uh, his followers, the, the, the Talmudim and the Gentiles, that Gentile believers, these are feasts that you need to observe. As we discussed in previous lessons, the feasts are prophetic because the root word of Moed, D, or Moed, is Ed, meaning until. 
So the feasts are prophetic. Now, in other words, Yeshua Jesus will fulfill all of the feasts eventually. Matthew 5.18 says, Yes, indeed, this is the complete Jewish Bible, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud or a stroke. Those are the two smallest letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, now, in English, it says jot or tittle. But Yeshua didn't speak English. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. He said, not a yud or a stroke will pass from the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. Not until everything that must happen has happened. Okay, but if you go to the verse before it in 517, in Matthew 517, he says, I've not come to abolish the, the Torah or the prophets. So he links those two together. And then in verse 18, he says, not until one, the slightest stroke passes away, not until everything that's supposed to happen will happen. Now, there are three Hebrew words for scripture, and they're translated in scripture that are translated into feast. I've mentioned two in the past. The first one is Chag, meaning celebration. But you will also find it celebrated, or I should say defined, in some versions of the Bible as a feast. It usually is referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's usually referring to the seven-day feast. It also refers to some other feasts during the time, like in, you'll find it also used in, in, in uh, some rabbinical or Hebrew versions of the book of Esther, because they had some feasts there also. You also have Mishtah, also found in the book of Esther. This is a banquet. And then, of course, you have Moed, meaning a sacred or holy assembly. But in, the, in context, it's actually Moadi Yehovah, as you can see on the screen. Uh, it's Moadi, it's the Lord's appointed time for the holy, assemb holy assembly of believers, of ecclesia, which is, the, which is the Latin word, or actually Greek. Now, I mentioned there are, there are nine total feasts of the Lord. There's one weekly feast, that is the Sabbath, or Shabbat, and that's found in Leviticus 23.3. And of course, the last time I compared you, I showed you what, what was happening in the in the uh, the different Ten Commandments, and you and if you remember the in Catholicism that has been changed. I'm not going to go with that again. There are eight annual feasts. Of the eight annual feasts, four in the spring, and four in the fall, as I've mentioned before, and the term generally used for all of these nine feasts is Moed. However, in context, as I've said several times already today, it's Moadi Yehovah. The term precedes the occasion of the assembly, but is usually translated in English into feast, and most people read over or miss the fact that these are... The in rabbinical Judaism, we are told to celebrate and keep God's feast as a memorial and as a remembrance of God's miracles which the Israelites witnessed and which are recorded in Scripture. But as believers, we understand them to be prophetic, as the Hebrew word, root word for moadi is until. Okay, while the feast, the spring feasts have been fulfilled, allowing us to be witnesses to those fulfillments, and in remembrance of them, the fall feasts are prophetic, and we will await their fulfillment. Amen. All right. Since the meaning of mekra'i is as an assembly, it can also be interpreted, as I mentioned earlier, as a rehearsal. Now, we will participate and rehearse for the wedding supper of the Lamb and the day of Yeshua's return. That's what this feast is essentially about. But I'm not going to cover that in detail until next weekend, next Saturday. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this is the King James Version, it tells us, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man or a woman, you have to remember in, in biblical times, man had statue before a stature before God, 
But today we all have stature before God because Paul clearly says that there is no, there is no uh, Jew, no, there is no male, there is no female. We're all one new man. Okay? So, so that a man or a woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, when we're talking about good works, we're again going back to Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, where we're told not to put a light on our lamp under a table, but to let it shine and to show our good works. Paraphrased. So we're told in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. We are to be a light to the world. Okay? Now, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, As previously taught in the first century, the only scripture which existed, in the, which existed was the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Okay? So, not a, but let me back up. I said we're supposed to be salt and light on Matthew uh, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. So at any rate, we'll back that up. Okay, keeping the feast is not, a rich, uh, is not ritualistic. We keep the spring feast in commemoration and in remembrance of Yeshua Jesus uh, that he's our Sabbath rest and that he fulfilled the spring feast on his first appearance. Now, he came as the Passover lamb the Passover sacrifice, fulfilling the Feast of Passover. Missed it. Yep. You already have this from last time, right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> but I take them all, yeah. and I print them, and then I write my notes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. During his first it. appearance, he was sinless, fulfilling the Feast of Unleavened Bread. During his first appearance, he was the first, of, he was the first fruits of the resurrection, fulfilling the first Feast of First Fruits, and... During his first appearance, he sent his helper, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the Feast of Weeks. Shavuot is the Hebrew word for weeks. Pentecost is where that comes from. But what about the Fall Feast? We went through this last time. When he returns, he's going to... We, well, let me put it this way. We prepare as we practice for his return until... Remember, that's the definition of the word. He fulfills the prophetic meaning of the fe Fall Feast. So when he returns, he'll rapture the church, that's believers, most likely on the Feast of Trumpets. Now I say most likely. Okay? He will judge believers and non-believers and Satan and his fallen angels. Remember when we talked about the Feast of, of Yom Kippur? The second goat was to be left free, to be put in in a uh, cauldron in the Dennis Desert until the day of the Lord. So that's what's going to happen. That's on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Now, he will claim his bride, the body of believers, the church, during the Feast of Tabernacles. Got too bad, it went too fast. Okay, and he's going to reveal the New Jerusalem, the Garden of Eden. And the tree of life. Now, I'll talk more about this next week or the week after. Because this is going to happen on Shmini Atzeret. This is the eighth assembly. And most, even messianic teachers, skip it. They talk about seven feasts. No, there are eight. There it is, right there. Shmini Atzeret. It just means the eighth assembly. Okay. All right, so let's talk about Moadi Yehovah Ha Sukkot, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord's Feast of Tabernacles this year occurs on September 23rd in the evening through September 30th. Now, let me give you a little background. Because it's required, I have to give you some background on this. Okay, the message of God's salvation, I was going to back up to this a few slides back, but I'll do it now, because now it's, it's where I should be bringing it in. It began in the Garden of Eden with the first messianic prophecy found in Genesis 3, 15. I've mentioned this numerous times. 
it will be completed when the New Jerusalem and the Garden of Eden will be revealed. Now we read in Revelation that the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life will be revealed. In other words, it's here somewhere on earth, but it's hidden from us, probably in a different dimension. It's my belief that this will occur at some future time at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I want you to understand what I put up there in red. It's my belief. Nobody really knows except the Father. It's on Shemini Atzeret. This is on the Eighth Assembly, the last of the fall feast. Now, there is one more feast that does occur beyond this date, but it actually occurs in the winter, not in the fall. Genesis 3.15 reads, After the serpent deceives Eve, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now what's interesting is the word that's used for crush and bruise is the same word, but they have two different definitions because of the contextual, contextual use. Now let me explain. Jacob's name before being changed to Israel was Yaakov. There it is, right Jean? You read her, you go, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Ya Yaakov. Okay? The Yah abbreviation for is for Yehovah. Now, often you find that abbreviations for God are part of males' Hebrew names. Oh. My name is Mecha El for Elohim. Oh. Okay. Akob means heal. Now, often, you have, in Hebrew, you have the words reversed. So, if you read Yaakov, it's God's heel, but more accurately translated, heel of God. Okay. Okay? So, that's Jacob's name. So, we read in Genesis 3.15 that... Satan is going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. So we're told right here in Genesis 3.15 that the Messiah is going to come through the seed of Jacob. Of Jacob. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first, the Feast of Tabernacles is now, if you keep in track, the third of the four fall feasts. Now, the Hebrew Moadi Yehovah Hasukot is found in Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 36. It reads, And the Lord spoke unto Moshe, unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So it's a seven-day feast. We also find this in Numbers 29, 12. Now, Scripture, interpret Scripture. So if you have a question about Scripture, you go to other parts of Scripture. Hi, Angel. I don't know you, Joel, but how, how, thanks for watching. <laughs> Leviticus 23, 33 to 36. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. In other words, it's a Sabbath rest, the first day. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, I'm, calling, I'm taking this from the Isaac Lisa, 1853 Bible. Okay, now, we don't have to do that, and Jews can't do that because there is no temple to make a sacrifice, although they're trying in Israel. Sukkot is one of the three pilgrimages required in Scripture in Deuteronomy 16, 16, as I've mentioned several times. And here's the Scripture from the Lisa Bible. It says, Three times in a year shall every male of every one of thy males appear before the Lord thy God in a place which he will choose on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the Feast of Weeks, and on the Feast of Tabernacles. That's Sukkot. And no one shall appear before the Lord empty. That goes for us today. Now, back in ancient times, we're talking about 
making a, a sin sacrifice or various uh, holiday sacrifice, which was called a chagiga, a special holiday sacrifice when the when the temple was in existence. But today you can still appear before the Lord and not have not be empty. You can bring your prayers. You can bring your uh, your uh, uh, what would I call it uh, your your praise stories, etc. And yeah, okay, it wouldn't be so bad to support your home church because let's face it, it costs money to operate churches. Okay, we read in 1 Kings 9, 25. Again, this is the Lisa Bible. And Solomon did offer three times in every year burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar which he had built unto the Lord and he burnt incense upon the one that was before the Lord so he finished the house. So, what is the saying? It says two things. It says Solomon observed the three feasts of the Lord, the three pilgrimages of the Lord, but it's also saying that he finished the house, finished the temple on Moedi Yehovah HaSukkot. The temple was dedicated on the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? Solomon observed the feast, we, write, we read in 2 Chronicles 8, 12, and 13, again, the Leaser Bible. Uh, uh, even according to what was due of every day on its day, offering according to the commandments of Moses on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the stated festivals three times in a year, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the Feast of Weeks, and on the Feast of Tabernacles. So even Solomon... Uh, yes, observe the feast. In rabbinical Judaism, Sukkot is the celebration of the 40 years in the wilderness. That's what your, my Alexa told you before she burned out. <laughs> but they celebrated it with God's provision. In Deuteronomy 2.7, this is the ESV version, for the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. In Deuteronomy 29.5, again the ESV. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you. And your sandals have not worn off your feet. Worn. Let me get that R back in there. Sorry about that New York accent. <laughs> <laughs> Nehemiah 19.21 this is from the Jewish Publication Society 1917 one of my favorite Bibles yea 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not this is Nehemiah the question here is, are you under God's protection in your wilderness? Everybody has a wilderness. Are you under God's protection? If you talk to him, if you're in the word, you should be. See, the feast, this is the feast, is the most important of all the feasts of the Lord. See, the Feast of Tabernacles, as I mentioned numerous times over the last three, four, five weeks, is the only feast that will be celebrated by Israel's enemies during his millennial reign. Zechariah 14, 16. This is from the JPS 1917 version. It reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah 14, 16. It goes on to say in verse 17, And it shall be that who, whoso of the families of the earth goeth not up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Upon them there shall be no rain. It continues in verse 18. If the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they shall have no overflow. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the nations that go not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. So, what is this saying? 
if you are Israel's enemy, you'd better go because otherwise the wrath of God comes down on you. Verse 19 says, This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that go not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So during the millennial reign, you all, all the nations will be going to Israel or they will suffer God's wrath firsthand. The importance of the Feast of Tabernacles is demonstrated. Here we have the first celebration of Sukkot after the Babylonian captivity. We read here, those who came with Zerubbabel and Ezra celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month for the first time in generations. In Nehemiah 8.2, JPS version, it says, and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that can, could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So this is the Feast of Trumpets. So we're not. this is not the Feast of Tabernacles, but the, is the month of Tishrei, the first uh, month, the first of the Feast of Trumpets, Nehemiah 8.2. We jump down to verse 16 now in Nehemiah 8. So the people went forth, and brought them and made themselves booths, that's tabernacles, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the broad, broad place of the water gate and in the broad place of the gate of Ephraim. Remember when they, Nehemiah went there, the first thing he did is rebuilt all the gates. Okay, so we have two gates here. So they, by these two gates, by the water gate and the gate of Ephraim in Nehemiah 8, they built booths in their houses. We read in the next verse in 18, And all the congregation of them that were came back of the captivity made booths and dwelt in the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was great gladness. Now think about this. Since Joshua, the, day, the son of Nun, they had not observed the Feast of Tabernacles, even though Moses in the wilderness told him, told them, wrote it, that these are three extremely important pilgrimages of the Lord, but yet they had not observed it since Joshua. Sukkot was celebrated after Antiochus Epiphanes IV was defeated. Now, the problem we have with this is that most people don't even understand what this is because it's in 2 Maccabees, found in the Apocrypha. It's one of those books. Now, the word Apocrypha does not mean intertestimonal books, but although they're referred to intertestimonal, it means hidden. These books were deliberately hidden from the, from the Christian church. It's found in 2 Maccabees, after the Seleucid emperor Antiochus Epiphanes IV was defeated and the temple was cleansed and rededicated. We actually read this in Matthew 24 where God says, when you see the desolation spoken of by the prophet, he doesn't mention Daniel, but that's what he's talking about, Daniel, this is, he will know, you will know that the time is near. Well, what's interesting is this had happened the temple had been desecrated the temple had been rededicated and this was hundreds of years almost you know it was it was basically over 150 years before uh, almost uh, about almost 200 years before Jesus was walked the face of the earth so he's saying it's going to happen again it's part of end time prophecy which means that if you guys are all talking to everybody here and there and, and online, if you're saying, come Lord Jesus, come, there's a couple of prerequisites that haven't happened yet. One I talked about earlier, there aren't enough believers in Jerusalem to welcome Jesus back. And two, there's no temple to be desecrated again. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a second temple, a third temple built, and it has to be desecrated just like it was on the Antiochus Epiphanes. Because mm -hmm. what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24 is it's going to happen again. Now, what's interesting is 2 Maccabees actually tells you about this prophecy fulfillment of Daniel's, but it's going to happen again. All right, let's continue. Although we now call this particular celebration Hanukkah, the festival of dedication, it's actually found in John 10, 22. Most people think it's a bookmark. No, Jesus was in the temple for a reason. Just People just don't really understand it. It's another 
pilgrimage. It's just not one of God's three most important ones. But because Solomon dedicated the temple on the Feast of Tabernacles, the Maccabees rededicated the temple, but it wasn't the Feast of Tabernacles. It was in December, but they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, that sort of tells us that the third temple is going to be dedicated on the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, the people observed the Feast of Tabernacles, which is why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. Now, I'm going to talk more about this another month or so. I'm not going to go into any detail. Other significance about Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles? Rabbinical Judaism teaches that God put the lights in the sky to separate the seasons in Genesis 1.14. I don't know if you've actually re realized it, but God always does his special feats. His feats always occur on his special appointed times. They always do. <laughs> in Genesis 1.14, not only did he put the lights in the sky, he established a 28-day lunar Hebrew calendar. Now, Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Let me show it to you. The following is scripture that will support it. I have to apologize for the people that are online. You're going to have to wait for me to edit and post it up on my YouTube and back on my Facebook because I will put these slides up there that people that are here can't see it. We read in Luke 124 about the priestly selection process. And even though the Pharisees were in charge of the temple, they followed the Levitical selection process and changed priests. They cast lots at the time of the three feasts described in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. This is when the temple priests uh, changed. They were appointed. They fulfilled their service and new, new temple priests came in. A, or one, Zacharias, his service would have concluded with one of the harvest feasts, harvest festivals. Now you see the feast of Passover or the feast of unleavened bread actually occurs during the barley harvest. The Feast of Tabernacles occurs during the wheat harvest. Okay? In, the, in this case, it would have been the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, Pentecost. Okay? That was essentially the barley harvest. So Elizabeth came, became pregnant, well, it's after, it's a month after, uh, seven weeks afterwards. Elizabeth became pregnant just after the Pentecost. Now, the conception of Jesus. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel visited Mary in Nazareth. That's in Luke one twenty six. So it's in Scripture. This was the Hebrew month of Kislev. All right? We read in Luke 2.7, the birth of the Messiah. This was the 10th lunar month and 280 days after Mary's pregnancy. Human pregnancy is 280 days. It's the month of Tishrei. Now, all of the spring of the fall feasts occur during the month of Tishrei. Okay, Feast of Tabernacles is next to the last feast at the end of the month of Tishrei. We still have Shemini at Sedet. Okay, we, we also look at other scripture. There was no room in the inn. Most likely, as it was one of these Lord's three most important pilgrimage feasts. So it had to be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Shavuot. Two of them in the spring, one of them in the fall. All right? The Feast of Tabernacles, the Tea Feast of Weeks, or Unleavened Bread, as I just said. I may not have said it in that order. Okay, the Roman or the Temple Tax in Luke 2.1. This would have been an appropriate time of the year for Caesar Augustus to oppose a tax as Jews were be, have, would have been in Jerusalem to pay their temple tax. Now, what most people don't realize in, in ancient times, Jew, Jews were exempt from paying taxes to, directly to Rome. The temple paid the taxes to Rome. Jews paid a temple tax. Okay? And they do it during those three pilgrimages. Now, two other things happened during those three pilgrimages. They updated birth and death records. So, all of the birth and death records were kept in the temple. 
Now that was all lost in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. So we've lost the birth and the death records. Now, in, let's do the math. In Luke 1, 5 through 2 and 7, here you have a table. I'm sorry, you guys watching online, you have to wait for me to publish this. We read, it, well, Passover occurs on the 15th day of Nisan. Now, the first fruits uh, occurs, the day of the week is unknown because we don't know what day of the week Passover occurred. So the Feast of First Fruits occur, occurs somewhere between the, 15th, uh, the 17th and the 22nd day of the month of Nisan. Shavuot is the month of Sivan. So that would have been uh, between the 16th and the 22nd of the month of Sivan. Now, Zechariah's temple service would have ended, again, somewhere between the 16th, we'll add one more day, and the 23rd day of Sivan. John the Baptist's conception then would have also been in that period of time, sometime between the 16th and the 23rd day of Sivan. Mary conceives Yeshua, that's in Kislev, and we know it's six months after John the Baptist's conception, so that would make it sometime between the 16th and the 20th day of the month of Kislev. And then the birth of Yeshua, 280 days later, would be somewhere between the 16th and the 28th day of Tishrei, and Sukkot occurs between the 15th and the 22nd day of Tishrei. So it's kind of right in there. So we would say that he most likely, we know he was born in the month of Tishrei, but if you take a look at the days there, it's right in the middle between the 15th and the 22nd, seven days right in there. That would have been his uh, Yeshua, Jesus' birthday. Okay, so there's the math. Now, God always, as I said earlier, shows his work on feast days. Now, the two events, the conception of John the Baptist and the conception and the birth of Jesus, which are aligned with the pilgrimage feast, are the, these are the only feasts which fall on the Gregorian calendar during the, excuse me, there's, there's, it falls during the month of Tishrei. There's only one other feast that, it falls in the, that falls on the Gregorian calendar, and that is in the month of December, uh, and that would be the Feast of Dedication. While it is important, while I mentioned it earlier, it's not one of the Lord's appointed seasons in Deuteronomy 16, 16. And I find it extremely hard to believe that God would not would, would do this on, uh, on any other feast day other than his three pilgrimages, because that's essentially when God always shows us his, his work. Additional scriptural proof. Let's take a peek. Let's look in the book of Revelation 12. Now, I did a a 20-minute video on this last year because last year there was a whole bunch of people writing books saying that Jesus was going to come on the 23rd of September. So I actually did a uh, uh, a 20-minute uh, video. It's actually on my on my Rosa Sharon Ministries uh, Facebook page, uh, the Ministry First Book page. Uh, I I think I don't know if it's on my on my personal page, and I think I also put it up on YouTube. I'm not sure, but essentially showing you that. They were not telling you, the scripture is not telling you when he's coming. The scripture is telling you when he was born. You see, we read in Revelation uh, 12, 1 through 6, this is Virgo, the virgin. So in Revelation uh, 12, 1 and 2, King James Version, it says, There appeared a, a great wonder in heaven, the woman clothed with the sun, S-U-N, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. We're talking about Mary. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. We read in verse 3 in Revelation 12, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. We're talking about Satan. All right? In verse 4, and his tail drew down a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. We're going back now to Genesis 3.15. We're talking about the first messianic prophecy. And we're talking about one of the thousands of events that, Jesus, that Satan has, has attempted to 
destroy the son, the seed of the woman. Okay? I also talked about this verse when we talked about when the a third of the heaven, a third of the angels were, uh, were thrown down to earth when we talked about the feast of Yom Kippur. All right. In verse 5 of Revelation 12, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should feed her so that he, excuse me uh, and they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days now this is referring to revelation 13 11 3 and 13 5 the two witnesses that's in the revelation 11 3 and the reign, reign of the beast that's in revelation 13 5 okay so that the so i'm not going to go into the uh into the thousand two hundred and thirteen uh three score days today but we're talking about the two witnesses, and we're talking about the, the reign of the beast uh, that comes at this time or from the scripture also. So she's hiding during the period of time of the two witnesses and of the reign of the beast. Or he, he's right. Okay? So the significance of Revelation 12, 1 through 6, the scripture tells us when Jesus was born. But only the Father knows when he will return. Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 2. Uh, 13 30 32 now we can we know the season we know what's going to happen this time of year but we don't know what year and we don't know exactly what day we can make the assumption it's going to be in the month of tishrei because god does all of his wonders on his feast days so there's a one in three chance that it's going to be on the month of tishrei during the feast of tabernacles all right, the feast of Revelation, uh, the significance of Revelation, the scripture speaks of a constellation Virgo, the Virgin, and Satan, the dragon. Now, I've used the scripture, as I said, to show you earlier how a third of the angels have fell. But we read in Psalm 147, 4, this is the ESV version, and he, the Lord, determines the number of stars. He gives all of them their names. So God uses the stars and the constellations in heaven for his own purposes. He named them all. Jesus was born and return on, will return on the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll show you why. Virgo and the red and the great red dragon are visible in the eastern sky in the configuration described in Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6, only during the month of Tishrei. There it is. It does not appear in that configuration, in that description of Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6, any other time of the year other than during the month of Tishrei. And there you've got the map, or the stars. So you see the woman, you see the dragon with his tail, woman over on the right, okay, I'll put this up online so you actually have them. Uh, but Scripture is very, very clear. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit. Let's talk about the presence of God and the Holy Spirit during this particular time. We've got a few minutes. I'm going to. I'm just going to go through the water libation here so that you actually understand uh, a particular uh, s ceremony that is o was only only took place on the Feast of Tabernacles on Sukkot in ancient times when there was a temple. All right, I'm going to show you in, from the Old and New Testament and connect Jesus, connect Yeshua to it. All right, it's called a water libation ceremony. In the ancient Sukkot temple celebration, it included a water lib libation ceremony. This is the only feast which uses this ceremony. Yeshua was preparing us for a time when there would be no temple. Now, holy water, in the temple ceremonies, holy water is drawn from the pool of Salome. It's also known as Solomon's Temple. 
It's also known as the the pool of 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 uh, uh, Shalom. It's a different uh, pronunciation. The holy water represented the Holy Spirit on earth in this ceremony. Continuing with the ancient Sukkot temple celebration, it also included pouring out new wine. New wine represented the presence of God on earth. Remember, no one has seen the face of God. Okay, so there had to be something to represent God on earth. Now, his Holy Spirit came down on certain people in the Old Testament to give them certain skills, how to build the tabernacle, how to build the Ark of the Covenant, gave them certain skills. And the Holy Spirit came into the Holy of Holies one time a year during the feast of Yom Kippur to the high priest who had to be totally clean, cleansed uh, both physically and uh, spiritually before going into the Holy of Holies. Okay, so in this ceremony, the holy water and the new wine are both poured out together on the temple altar symbolically representing the presence of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit during this celebration and during this celebration only at no other time of the year when there was a temple was this ceremony ever performed. It gives you an indication of how precious and how holy this particular feast of the Lord is compared to all the other feasts. This is not done at any other pilgrimage, at any other of the eight feasts of the Lord. This is the only time it was done, the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, it should alert you to the fact that the Feast of Tabernacles is so important to the Lord well, we already know it's the only one that's going to be celebrated by all of Israel's enemies during the during the millennial reign. But when you get something this unique, this specific to this feast, it has to put an exclamation point on this feast if you've not understood that. Now, we read in John 19.34, King James Version, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out Blood, representing new wine, and water. Okay? In John 7, uh, 37 through 39, Yeshua refers to this ceremony. It says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's quoting the prophets. Now, he's quoting scripture. Remember, in Jesus' time, the only scripture there was was Tanakh, the Old Testament. John seven thirty nine. Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified to further confirm that yeshua that sukkot is about yeshua jesus john 5 5 and 6 king james version it reads who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that jesus is the son of god this is he that came by water and blood even jesus christ not by water only but by water and blood and it is the spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Continued in John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Feast of Tabernacles is a time to rejoice. Many believe that on this day, the Messiah Yeshua Jesus will establish his kingdom on earth for 1,000 years, known as the millennial reign. Revelation 24 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Yeshua 
Jesus, and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or the image and had not received the mark on, on their, upon their forehead and upon their hand, that should be hand, and they came to life and reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. The Feast of Tabernacles is definitely a time to rejoice when Yeshua Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth. All nations will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, Zechariah 14, 16 through 19. I'm going to conclude that at that point. The next time what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking the Feast of Tabernacles and the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony so that you will actually see that this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And with that I say, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you've enjoyed this, those of you that are watching online, if you got some knowledge out of it, I encourage you to share this and tell the, your, your disciples, your disciples, to continue to share it. This is a message that needs to get out. Most New Testament churches don't understand the significance of this. As a matter of fact, most Messianic congregations, although they understand the significance of this, they spend so much time in ritual, rabbinical ritualism that they don't actually emphasize the, the, the tremendous importance that this feast is to God and to all of the body of believers. Bashem Yeshua Mishrachenu. Until next time, I'm going to sign off and I'm going to open this up in the room here to any questions that we might have. I'll see you guys next time. Signing off on Facebook.